let's get started. Um, <laughs> so my name is Katarina Pistor. I'm on the board of the Heyman Center, but I teach at the law school here at Columbia University. It gives me a great, my great pleasure to introduce Matthias Thiemann back to the Columbia community. Matthias got his um, PhD in sociology. When exactly? Ten think, years ago. Ten years ago. Oh, wow. I was on his committee and I think so was Josh. Um, and uh, we've, been in, keep, we, we've been keeping in touch ever since. He now teaches at Sciences Po in, uh, in Paris and is working mostly on uh, questions of financial market institutions and structures. And his, uh, the topic of his talk today is the potential governance of financial market liquidity. Um, we have two great commentators, one, Saula Omorova, who will be familiar to most of you, um, at least those who have followed the nomination proceedings in Congress and elsewhere. Uh, um, and she eventually, as you know, had to withdraw her um, nomination because, um, yeah, I think, because you grew up in Kazakhstan, were deemed a communist right. because you grew up in a communist country. I think right. that was the reason. Um, Saula is a professor of uh, law and financial regulation at Cornell University and has published um, a lot on uh, thinking not only about how the system currently works but also has a lot of imagination and creativity in thinking how else we could organize our financial and economic system um, in the future. Uh, so I think I couldn't um, think of a better commentator and Sally just came back from Europe so we made her stop over in New York to comment on uh, T.S. paper. And then Lev Menand is a new colleague of mine at the law school. He just started in January. Um, he is, in uh, my view, the foremost expert perhaps on, on the law of the Fed. He just published a book, um, The Fed Unbound, uh, which is uh, I think now almost ready for, for ordering, right? Um, and, uh, and he teaches central banking administrative law and financial regulation um, or is about to start teaching this at the at Columbia Law School. So he too is just an expert in the field and should make for a really good conversation. I also want to welcome the people online. So we, we see you through the eyes of the owl here and we will hopefully hear you. I encourage you to put questions in the chat and we might also call on you to ask the questions uh, directly, but it might be easier for me to follow what's going on in the chat. So what we'll do is um, we'll give Matthias the floor for about 30, 35 minutes to present his paper. And then Saul and, um, and Lev will each take about 10 minutes to comment. And then we have a discussion and questions as again, are, are welcome. We might also just have a little back and forth on the panel depending on what's happening in the, in the, in the comments um, uh, section. So thank you so much for coming. Really appreciate it. Matthias, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Katarina. And thank you very much for inviting me. I am very happy to be here and very honored to also sit on a panel with three such eminent scholars. I'm really excited for at least the last two months about this. Uh, and then I have to give a paper that I've never given before. So <laughs> great, uh, which is titled The Prudential Governance of Financial Market Liquidity. And uh, I wanted to give, I want to give this talk in the context of a book that I seek to finish on um, the changes in financial regulation after the financial crisis, and in particular on the attempt of a, a macro prudential uh, change agents, that is, people who care about the system as a whole, to transform the financial system. In that sense, my talk will be more positive and normative, and of course, this had to happen. Okay, now I want to start off with a definition of financial market liquidity, because I thought to myself, I should define my terms, right? And so I have picked this uh, quote by SEC Governor Kara Stein to give you the common understanding of financial market liquidity. Here it is, liquidity or how long it takes to sell an investment and turn it into cash without affecting its price can be an important piece of information for mutual fund and exchange traded fund or ETF investors. And so the understanding that is here is basically the depth of a market. And so if you want to sell, how much of a discount do you have to accept, right? And so focusing on this, Statecraft has dealt with this or tried to facilitate this kind of market liquidity, the depth of financial markets since at least the 17th century. And so what it has done is it has sought to promote transparency, standardization, the limitation, of also that people trust the market, right? But this is not exactly the kind of um, a problem or problematization that I want to speak about today. Instead, 
what I want to speak about is a new, what I would argue is a new, arguably, a new problematization about systemic liquidity risks in the context of market-based banking. That is, these risks do not regard you or me as we are trying to sell our, whatever we have, financial markets, but instead they regard the entire financial system and in turn the real economy because suddenly many people try to sell the financial markets. Why does this matter? I think it matters because we're living in a system, in a new configuration of financial markets and banks um, that has become known as the shadow banking system or market-based banking, or one could also add bank-based markets, whereby um, um, market liquidity, that is the going price of assets and markets, and funding liquidity, that is the capacity of these entities to refinance themselves, has become tightly coupled. Okay, and that is the case for at least the last 30 years, and it has given rise to this problematization where these uh, actors that I will speak to you about look at this increasing interlinkage and think about how could we prudentially regulate these liquidity risks in order to prevent others from suffering because there is this run unfolding. What I will argue okay, is that. Uh, central banks in their role as have found themselves in their role as market maker of last resort. That is, in the great financial crisis 2008, suddenly they had to backstop all the markets, they had to backstop the system. And since then, they have pushed for this prudential liquidity regulation. However, it has not, it has only given way to very limited re regulation of financial markets because. They had to come to an agreement with market regulators, which have largely opposed this kind of thinking. They have basically said, no, no, we're thinking about it in this way. We're thinking about transparency, standardization, limitation of fraud. We don't even know what systemic risk is. What are you talking about? And this is the gentle interpretation of things, because I could also give you a story of political economy and capture, uh, of which I today want to largely refrain and maybe bring this up at the end. Okay, so what I wanna do is I wanna introduce you to this rising problematization, the great financial crisis and what happened afterwards in terms of regulation and why I can tell you today that it has largely failed. An interesting claim, which I'm sure my commentators will possibly contest, but um, what I will argue is that what has become known as the dash for cash that is the events in financial markets during COVID, when there was a liquidity event, a liquidity crisis, and the, Fed, the central bank, the Fed had to step in and again be the market maker of last resort, show us that these regulations really didn't address the problem. Okay, so it's essentially, I will argue there was a rerun of the financial crisis in 2020, and what we see is uh, the regulation really didn't address the problem. So when we go back to the 1980s, the first thing that we can see is the dominant uh, view on financial market liquidity, where it's the more the better. And so everything that we can analyze and observe is that really there's a big alliance between traders, academics, and financial market regulators that say private risk management is optimal. Let's just expand financial market liquidity and everybody will be better off. This everybody in terms of actors also includes central bankers and legislators because they will, for example, they seek to build a strong repo market, which you will hear about in a second, whereby they extend safe harbor uh, also to private debt instruments, such as mortgage-backed securities, and thereby increase the liquidity of these financial markets. Central banks also build repo markets, such as in the Eurozone, to uh, engage better in monetary policy. In other words, there's a deep entanglement of central banks and private market liquidity whereby these actors really become drawn to each other and come to depend on each other. In the shadow of this, however, if one looks very carefully, one can find that the central bankers were not all just gung-ho about financial market liquidity. Instead, there were actually um, doubtful or critical voices. Even, even Alan Greenspan can be found to give a speech in 1995 in which he largely is d'accord with the expansion of financial markets and really thinks that the leveraged financial system is great and the central bank should backstop this, this new system. But he still thinks we should think about 
how we should modulate the system such that it doesn't happen more than a few times per century. That is 25, that is 27 years ago. Since then we had at least two of these interventions. I leave it to you to judge whether that qualifies for a few times per century, but we don't know the future, so maybe it is. This concern actually only grows with financialization and financial crisis. And so what one can see is that this, in particular, the central banker community becomes increasingly worried about market liquidity and in particular liquidity black holes where they say, well, what, what's gonna happen if suddenly nobody wants to buy or nobody wants to sell? How is the system gonna work? But what one can see when one looks at these guys is that they formulate their concerns, but they have their way too weak to oppose this growth of market-based banking and bank-based markets. So they're down in the, in the side room. They sit somewhere there and say, hmm, that might be risky, but they, they don't really make a difference. Now, that really changes when the financial crisis unfolds. And I don't know how familiar you are with the financial crisis. On the one hand, it is a crisis of too much credit. And you have heard the story, mortgages, too many mortgages given. But it is also a crisis of evaporating financial market liquidity and funding liquidity. And that point has been made by Gordon, by Bernanke early on. In that sense, it was framed as a run on short-term private liabilities, which really aggravated the crisis. In other words, these experts were looking at this mortgage market and were saying, how can a $600 billion market create such a huge problem for a $20 trillion financial system? And the answer became that there was a shadow banking system that basically collapsed and which only could be saved through the forceful intervention of central banks. So what central banks, the Fed had to do in 2008 was basically backstop the market, buy everything and thereby reflate the system, okay? And therefore I wanted to give you this just so you know what I'm talking about. This is a depiction of the shadow banking system in which you can see the dealer banks are at the center of it all, but in a sense it is risk-loving actors such as hedge funds that borrow money in order to invest and risk-averse actors such as money market funds that seek places to put their money at some place safe. And these actors before the financial crisis that were disguised where you could place your money safely were the dealer banks, okay? Now, this system basically collapses in 2008, okay? And these central bankers now have to I don't want to say bail it out, but they have to backstop it. And as you may uh, imagine, they're not really happy about it. So is the public. The public really goes uh, rather angry, gets rather angry with the Fed and curtails their capacity to backstop the system, or at least so we thought. So in this moment, the problematization of financial market liquidity really takes off. And there's this brilliant paper by Bruno Meyer and Pedersen that becomes very, very influential, has 5,000 citations and basically shows us how market liquidity and funding liquidity are interlinked in the system, which can lead to these vicious liquidity spirals. So a lack of market liquidity translates into a lack of funding liquidity, which translates into a further lack of market liquidity until you go all the way down. And so this is not only a concern shared by academic economists that show how you have this pro-cyclical behavior, but it's also a concern shared by the central banking community which comes together in the Financial Stability Forum and problematizes liquidity, leverage, and valuation, which ends up in this report that says, like it's this work, how should we re-regulate the financial system? And it's at, at this point in time, and this is how, this is how they envision it. Yeah? So this is the negative feedback loop that they envision. And I can talk more about this if you want to know, but for me, the crucial aspect as a sociologist is that the first time they get together in 2009, and so there are the central bankers that are really worried about the system and its pro-cyclicalities, and suddenly they find market regulators. And these market regulators are like, what are you talking about? And they completely disagree. So it's a real clash of epistemic cultures. It is also a, a clash of jurisdictions because these market regulators, they have the control and they don't want to give that control to the bank regulators. Okay, so the bank regulators would like to put bank-like regulation on these actors and the market regulators block everything. That's what happens, that's what I've been told when I interviewed these people, and in the end what you get is a call for further research. 
which I was told is the uh, fallback, fallback option when you cannot agree on anything, we need more research. So they need more research on aggregate liquidity and they dream of a future in which there could be an enhanced system-wide supervision of aggregate liquidity. Now, this of course, we go into a short year in which they figure out Basel three, and then in 2010, the G20 comes back to the Financial Stability Board and says, hmm, there's a shadow banking system. Can you please do something about it? And so they get together and they have to actually bring together in the Financial Stability Board market regulators and central bankers and even treasuries. And when I interviewed people at the FSB, what they told me is they had really difficulties in even finding a common language and a common understanding. So what market regulators would all the time ask is, can you define financial stability? Can you tell me what is systemic risk? How, how can I operationalize this as a market regulator? So they had a very hard time. And when I further probed with other economists and so on, they told me, look, the economists in a market regulator are the guys that focus on efficient markets, financial market liquidity, and they think that financial market really is great. And so there was, again, this clash of cultures and what I want to do in the rest of this talk is tell you a little bit how this clash of cultures unfolded with respect to the three markets that I have chosen. We might hear that not all of them are well chosen, but I will speak to you about money market mutual funds, the repo market, and open-ended funds. What brings all of them together is that they're all crucial in the provision of liquidity, at least for money market funds and for repo markets, or they're crucially dependent on liquidity, that is open-ended funds. Now, what I, what I will show you, what I want, want to talk about is essentially, it always follows the pattern. You can think of this as like a frontal attack of the bank regulators that say, I want bank-like regulation for money market mutual funds. They quack like a duck, they talk like a duck, whatever. So they are a bank, they need to be regulated like a bank. Okay, they have, they have short-term liabilities that fund uh, and, and they're runnable. So I want capital. I want capital imposed on them. And what basically happens is that the SEC um, goes into full rebellion. Something happens that hasn't happened much in the history. Basically, the three or five commissioners say, we will not vote for this proposal. This is not what we think should happen, even if it has been worked and developed by the head of the SEC, together with the Financial Stability Council, they say, we will not do it. Which in the end leads to the resignation of the SEC chairwoman, okay? So the SEC chairwoman has to resign and they request to restart, completely restart this analysis. And the first thing they do is they go to their economists and they say, isn't it enough what we already have? Do we really need something new? Unfortunately for them, I. I read through the lines here, so I'm not sure if they were really unhappy, but the economists come back and say, we do think we do need some more regulation. And so they set out to develop some new regulation in which they, however, will refuse anything that looks like bank regulation, okay? So the only thing that they will really uh, agree to is to move from constant net asset values, which is basically guaranteeing that what you invest is always worth the money that you have invested, which allows the treatment of money money like uh, these, these liabilities. And they say, we will install liquidities and li liquidity fees and liquidity gates for fund managers. So if there is a run, these fund managers can stop it. It's not us, we will not do it, they will do it. If they think it is better for them. So we will not force them. And so in a sense, you see this delegation to the private agents, which preview will fail in 2020. The second thing that they do and that they're very happy about is they pride themselves on the fact that they have saved the industry because they have per per permitted the persistence of the cash equivalent status of money market mutual fund shares. And so you can see how these guys, and that's not very surprising, they're close to the industry and they want it to, to remain. Now, the one thing we do see as a result of this reform is that in essence, uh, most of the money moves here. In 2017, when this is implemented, a lot of the money moves into the government fund, uh, into the government funds that invest in treasury markets. And so these are really 
almost risk-free assets. And uh, there's, uh, yeah. The next thing, the repo market. The repo market is a place where you go when you need liquidity and you just pledge your collateral. Let's say you have a treasury bond and you're gonna get money for that. Turns out this is a trillion dollar market on which central banks had no data, nor did market regulators have data, which is a little bit surprising when you make an interview. However, in 2012, they start to cartograph it and the financial stability board does, and they formulate a work program in which they say, well, they first of all completely endorse Bruno Meyer and Pedersen. They say this, this this feedback loop is very bad. So we need at least through the cycle haircuts such that funding does not get too cheap when everybody is too enthusiastic. Okay, so they're trying to put a limit on how cheap funding can get. And what happens is then, however, an absolutely minimal consensus, which is so low that when I spoke to central bankers, they told me that even in 2008, or 2007, sorry, at the height of the boom, the actual haircuts were higher than the through the cycle minimum haircuts that were the final agreement, okay? Which is, and so uh, the banking regulators, I don't wanna say they're furious, but they're really disappointed. Okay, they say, this is even worse than what we had before. And they're still really unhappy about these broker dealers that they think are really responsible for prosecutor behavior. So what they do is they use the fact that they're now under their authority because the broker dealers became banks. You may remember Goldman Sachs had to become a bank, Merrill Lynch became a bank. And so what they do is they force banking regulation on them very consciously, really very much to the dislike of the Properties. Yeah, they say you you will have to give core capital for every time you give liquidity. An unexpected consequence of this, however, was that suddenly broker dealers did not want to do markets anymore. So suddenly they produced exactly the result that they were fearing, which is a liquidity black hole. Nobody wants to trade. So what happens if nobody wants to trade? the central bank has to step in. So we see these moments in 2014, 2019, where the central bank already has to step in and backstop the market, which is a, an unintended consequence that they're still trying to process. And, and so they're facing this, this difficulty that on the one hand, they're kind of happy that they have regulated it. On the other hand, they're really unhappy because they have to step in. And the last one is the prudential regulation of mutual funds, uh, which, their growth really becomes a major concern because they, the central banks see that the provision of private liquidity is really reduced after 2014. And why is that a problem? Again, these mutual funds are like a bank, I will argue, because they refinance increasingly illiquid bonds and corporate debt. So stuff that you cannot sell easily in financial markets, without getting accepting a discount and they refinance through shares that investors can redeem on a daily basis. So I can go there today and say, I want my money. So then they will have to sell their assets. But if many people go there and say that, they will have to sell a lot of illiquid assets, which in turn can you get this run dynamic. Yeah, people observe, oh, there's a run and more people run. And that can lead to very bad things happening. Now, again, and so this is just to show you that in 2008, the entire mutual fund industry has a size of 18, 16 trillion dollars. And in 2020, it has a size of 45 trillion dollars. Okay, so this has tripled. And this has not tripled from 10 million or 10 billion, but from 10 trillion dollars to 45 trillion dollars. So it's a problem. And in particular, what has grown is these investments in illiquid bonds and high yield bond funds, which is singled out as a problem by the central bankers. Now, when the central bankers start to get real about this, there is a huge uproar in 2013. The SEC says, no way. Uh, the Congress says, uh, sends a cease and desist order to the Financial Stability Council and says, do not regulate this or we will unfund you. And so these people are trying to work this out, but they basically fail. 
And so you see this alliance between the SEC and the asset management industry, despite the concerns of these uh, economists and the central bankers. Now, however, and this is maybe the big message that I also want to bring along as a sociologist, through all this friction and through all this fighting, the SEC starts at some point to appreciate these concerns. They do not translate them the same way that banking regulators do, but they say there is an issue. So what they do is they update the liquidity management of these open-ended funds and they force them to have actually a liquidity risk management plan to engage in stress testing and to report a lot more data. And so they install these liquidity risk buckets that we can talk about, which I think are a very interesting development as a first attempt to force these uh, asset managers at least to be aware of the fact that they're investing in liquid assets and they limit the amount de facto that they can invest in these liquid assets. However, all of this is again delegated to the fund managers. So the SEC cannot do anything. Instead, it says, you figure it out. You do the analysis. And if something goes wrong, I will come to you after the fact and I will punish you. But I will not ex ante force you to do anything. Okay. Now, all of this, I will argue, comes to a dramatic um, crescendo and then to a really big problem in the dash for cash in March 2020. As, the COVID, as COVID is declared a pandemic, there is a run. Everybody's like, what, what is everything worse? Nobody knows what something is worse. So people start to run. People take their cash out. People take their mutual fund shares out. And basically, the plumbing of financial markets break down. The repo market doesn't work anymore. The money market mutual funds experience very strong outflows for the prime funds that I showed you earlier. And lastly, the mutual funds, and this seems to be debatable, but I'm happy to defend this position, also experience a run. What, what happens then is that the Federal Reserve intervenes and provides in the course of three weeks $1,000 billion of liquidity to financial markets and backstops to financial markets to such a degree and so successfully that you maybe have not heard of this, okay? Because they stop the panic before it really gets going, okay? And however, basically, and this is just to show you, here's the money market fund outflow that is in the prime funds. Here is the mutual fund net outflow in March 2020, and so you see how this is like a huge deviation, or, and you see how this goes down and then goes up again. But the reason for it going up again, and that's very important, is the intervention by the Fed. The announcement that the Fed says, we will buy, if nobody else buys, we will buy, secures everybody. So I was like, okay, I don't have to run, okay? But basically, what do we learn from this crisis? And this one more time showing you the same thing. What do we learn from this crisis? And here, here are all the things that the Fed does. So the Fed basically goes in overdrive, yeah? Like in, in like three weeks, they restart everything they did in 2008, 2009 in three weeks, okay? The entire machine is starting up again and the market maker of last resort goes into uh, action. Okay, so what do we learn and what do they learn? What happens is they say, oh, money market mutual funds, really, we need to do some reform. And again, they come up with this idea of bank-like regulation and again, the SEC says, no way. There is not going to be capital. There's not going to be, this is not a bank. What they learn, however, they say is, look, this last time we did the liquidity piece and the liquidity gates, they were really a problem for two reasons. First, the investors ran because they thought that they cannot take out their money. Secondly, no money market mutual fund actually imposed any of these. So on the one hand, the mutual funds did not impose them. On the other hand, you have more runs. So this is really pro-cyclical. So they want to remove it and replace it with swing pricing, which is automatically, su supposedly, integrating the negative externet, it's basically a discount. So if I go and I take my money out, there will be a discount that takes into account that I'm forcing the money market fund to sell their assets. That's the idea. We don't know if it's going to work. Arguably, I would say this addresses the procyclical nature of regulation, but it doesn't really address the procyclical nature of the system as a whole. On mutual funds, we haven't heard anything yet, although I will argue there has been a run of 80 billion 
uh, euros from these illiquid high yield bond funds and so on. And basically as a conclusion, I would like to conclude the repo market, they're debating it. They have now a standing repo facility, but they don't know really yet what they will do. And we can of course discuss this if you're interested. Now, as a conclusion, I would argue that the attempt to regulate these liquidity risks, these prudential liquidity risks emerging from the shadow banking sector, it has produced incremental results, uh, which demands this increased liquidity risk management by private actors, but leaves the public actors with very limited capacities to intervene. So they, they still, everything is on, on, the, on, the, on the private. The central banks are still market makers of last resort, so they backstop the financial system. However, and I think it's the first thing I would like to bring your attention to, there has been no public outcry over the liquidity black backstop of the shadow banking system the second time. So the first time it was a scandal, the second time it was actually great. Yeah? Now, um, the problem with that is because they were so successful, that actually mutes the regulatory response. So if you have public outcry, you can use that against the industry. Now there is no public outcry and BlackRock, which is the strongest actor in this space is very strong at defending the fact that nothing happened. We're still here. What are you talking about? There is no problem, okay? Now, um, I think uh, to be a little bit uh, polemical for the moment is I think the structural vulnerability should be addressed by just simply limiting the liquidity transformation that happens in the shadow banking system in particular for open-ended funds. So my argument is if you can withdraw your money only in a month from now, this will not fundamentally change your investment behavior and not for all open-ended funds. So open-ended funds that invest in treasury bonds, that invest in equity, they can go on, you know? But if you invest in a highly illiquid bond fund, well, you know, the fact that it is highly illiquid should be taken into account in the redemption policies of this open-ended fund, okay? And so to conclude, I think today we're living in a world of a very asymmetric regime of central bank intervention, where in, a, in essence, the system is backstopped if there is a liquidity crisis, but there is little to no intervention in the boom times, which actually gets only worse by the fact that actors know that in bad times, there will be a backstop. So you get, from my perspective, almost the worst of both worlds. You get a public liquidity backstop of private market actors taking risks, and you get little to no capacity to actually intervene what these guys are doing in the good times. Thank you. Thank you. So we'll stop sharing here so people can really see us. Um, and I will just turn it over. Maybe Sally, you are next for <laughs> 10 minutes. You can move the owl a little yes. bit so people can see you. You can see people. Can yes. See you also. Yeah, good. And then we'll try. Whoops, not the whole thing. Oops. Okay. Does it work? Does it work? Yeah. And I will just, um, so, so it's, yeah, the floor is yours. I'll just check in. Well, this is uh, my first time speaking to an owl. <laughs> so I apologize if I am less articulate than I usually am. Usually I'm really articulate. Anyway, um, this is, uh, thank you very much, Matthias and Katarina for inviting me to this uh, wonderful event. I thoroughly enjoyed re reading the, the paper. Uh, the paper is written on a, an extremely important topic, which is uh, unfolding efforts uh, to regulate so-called shadow banking. And uh, the story is told through the lens of this sort of financial stability boards program uh, that was adopted over a decade ago in 2011. Uh, and specifically on three aspects of that program, the regulation of money market funds, repo markets, and uh, open-ended um, open uh, credit funds or asset managers are running those funds, right? And so, as Matthias's paper shows, the focus of these regulatory efforts was preventing liquidity shocks or runs. So a run is uh, yet another metaphor used to um, describe what the problem is. And in that sense, it's basically focal conceptualizing of, uh, of or identification of a problem. And in some ways, it's kind of fascinating to me how the identification itself 
shapes the responses, shapes the understanding of what the underlying dynamics may be. And the focus is explainable quite easily because we know that in times of crisis, liquidity shocks are the most visible triggers for the systemic fallouts, right? And typically the solvency issues like the solvency or insolvency of Lehman Brothers, for example, knee insolvency of AIG, they follow these liquidity shocks first. So in a sense, solvency follows liquidity. Um, and it's interesting kind of to bring that in because traditionally bank regulation uh, has been, particularly pr prudential bank regulation has been focused on banks solvency. Whereas in the securities capital markets, the focus of everything was on liquidity. Liquidity is the king. The entire uh, sort of uh, reason for existence of capital markets and the regulatory goal is to preserve the depth and the liquidity of capital markets. Everybody should be trading all the time. Otherwise, why have that? We can just go to the bank and get into that kind of a steady and uh, static relationship, right? So what this paper does is identify this difference uh, between kind of focus, prudential focus on solvency first and foremost, and markets and market regulatory focus on uh, capital market regulatory focus on liquidity. As this difference manifests itself in the competing regulatory strategies pursued by central banks on the one hand and so-called market regulators, basically capital markets regulators like the ACC on the other hand. And I found that focus uh, of the paper fascinating. I, I thought it was a fascinating study in this sort of intra-regulatory dynamics and differences that uh, we are kind of aware of, you know, not, none of that is really uh, earth shattering, but it's incredible how tangible it becomes when uh, the paper really traces it in, in such concrete fashion. And the paper's main conclusion is that we are now in the era of effectively permanent public backup of private market liquidity. In other words, what we're doing here, what we're, we're based, not we, we're not doing it. <laughs> it's done to us. We have to accept the fact that the fundamental uh, mechanism that used to live only in the area of regulated banking with a focus on the solvency of individual banking institutions, now that mechanism is being expanded and transposed to capital markets that are supposed to be free markets where people, you know, as long as they uh, have proper information and not being defrauded, should be free to take their risks and fall on their backs should those risks materialize, right, uh, to their disadvantage. So I couldn't agree more with this unfortunate conclusion. We are in an era where public backup of private market liquidity in this ostensibly free, fast-moving, risk-loving capital markets, unfortunately, is a necessity we cannot deny anymore, and we shouldn't be pretending to deny it, right? The question is why? And this is where, it, th that's a trillion dollar or gazillion dollar question, right? Why is it, what is it about this shadow banking now so neutrally called non-bank financial intermediation, right? Uh, what is it about this thing that sort of, uh, that, that creates that necessity, that links the banking world and the capital markets that for decades have been separate in their logic and their regulatory uh, sort of, uh, you know, dynamism or regulatory assumptions, now fuses them together functionally, right? So I think the bigger conceptual and normative story here in Matthias's paper is that of the public-private balance of power, functions, responsibilities in our financial system, right? And that actually happens to be the main thing in my own work in the past, whatever, many years, and also in uh, sort of the new generation scholars work like Lev here, right? Yeah, if you make me feel like an ancient uh, sort of dinosaur of financial regulation scholarship, but be it as it may. So um, conceptually, the way I see our financial system, and I'm sure if you would agree with it, is that it is, uh, it is neither purely public nor purely private. It is actually a form of public-private partnership of sorts, 
right? So uh, the metaphor that I used uh, with my co-author uh, back seven years ago, or however long we published that paper, was the finance franchise. It's a franchise system. The sovereign public effectively outsources franchises out a very public function of creating sovereign money uh, to private actors of particular kind, chartered licensed banks, right? And so banks uh, create sovereign money effectively when they issue deposits uh, and they do it concurrently with making loans. They effectively create elastic currency that is, it's a private liability, but it circulates as if it were completely identical uh, synonymous and exactly equal to sovereign money, which it isn't. And they do it in the process of creating credit for the economy. So you basically have this allocation or the delineation of functions, right? Private banks allocate credit and in the process of credit allocation, they actually create money that circulates in the economy. And the public franchisor uh, represented most prominently by the central bank basically is uh, responsible for guarding, safeguarding the systemic stability, making sure through monetary policy, for example, and various regulatory uh, mechanisms that there is no over issues of those private liabilities by the banks. So we don't have this inflation because of that, that the money is sound and um, that you know we basically have enough money, but not more than just enough money to make the economy going, right? So even in that description, right, uh, sort of simple as it may be, you can see how this is a very fragile arrangement. It is fundamentally dependent on this public backup because the central bank only can run that system if it gives direct access to the special franchisee banks, direct access, access to its own balance sheet, basically accommodating those privately created liabilities and sending signal to the entire society don't you worry none. You know, if you have a deposit at Bank of America and I have a deposit at Little Tompkins Trust somewhere in Ithaca, right in the middle of nowhere, it doesn't matter whose liability we're using. It's all the same. It's exactly equal to the liability of the sovereign <coughs> federal government, right? So that's sort of the mechanics of it. And uh, it, that arrangement is it's also dependent fundamentally on regulation. And uh, the regulation that banks are subject to is sort of, you know, one can think of it as a franchise fee. It's the, it's the price that banks have to pay in order to be able to finance their assets, those loans that they extend by issuing money effectively, right? Um, and, uh, or, you know, regulation, banking regulation can be thought of as a, some kind of a quality control by the franchise or by the public, by the sovereign, by the central bank and bank regulators on the nature of, of, of uh, that banking activity. So, um, what shadow banking has done is it, it sort of has transcended that, that uh, separation of that special club, that money creation agents, the banks that are backed by the central uh, bank on the one hand, and capital markets. Because there is that assumption behind that system, the franchise system, that the banking system, that special club of money creators is entirely separate from capital markets. Capital markets should be left to their own devices. That's where true intermediation takes place. That's where intermediaries, broker dealers, they have greater access and ability to process information, understand the risks, they bring in you know, various parties and go away. So shadow banking actually has done something that was not done before on that same scale, functionally fused those two worlds. They functionally fused it. Effectively, what shadow banks do is that they replicate and amplify this um, you know, credit money generation that you, you used to be confined to the banking system, but outside of that banking system. And what it does is because the franchise or the central bank in this case, wasn't able to police that perimeter, keep that club closed, right? And allowed for that replication through various other like repo markets and money market funds and whatnot, these other mechanisms to go on, now the central bank has to extend the safety net uh, in one way or another. And Matisse's piece very effectively traces how specific regulatory decisions, this is why I love the paper, specific regulatory decisions uh, in these three areas actually led to or enhanced this result in the past decade. And that is an important contribution to the literature. 
And what I would like to see more of in the next iteration of this paper are a couple of things. One is I would like to see a sharper explanatory focus. I know that Matthias said that this is a positive paper, but even as a positive paper, I think it would be greatly improved if there is a, a clear, a clearer uh, sort of explanation up front. Uh, where do these regulatory or regulators differences really come from? In other words, I don't want to hear, I don't want to read another sociological paper or legal scholarship paper about the so-called political economy of regulation, explaining how different you know, industry or interest groups have power over particular regulators, why some regulators are more captured than us. Uh, we've seen it, we've heard it, we keep hearing it. That's not what I mean. What would be interesting is that are there structural factors or perhaps some dynamics, relational dynamics in the markets themselves, like the money markets, or um, I don't know, the repo markets or uh, whatever markets that Matthias is looking at. Are there these dynamics there that explain the regulators reluctance to see the different side of the solution or different side even of the problem? Why is it that liquidity is such a king in, uh, with relation, in relation to you know, certain regulatory schemes? Is there something inside the markets that actually dictates that? Or perhaps, other cognitive blocks uh, in the regulators, regulator's mind that don't come from the fact that, oh, you know, there are economists here and there are lawyers there, but perhaps come from the core assumptions that are baked into uh, the capital markets regulations, for example, that come to us from something that was true in the 1920s and 1930s, but is not true anymore. It would be really fascinating to look at some of those core assumptions that are conceptual, intellectual, and then they shape these things. And finally, the second thing I would like to see is, and I know that as a sociologist, you shy away from normative conclusions, but at the end of your paper, you kind of hit that, hit, hint at them, right? Um, and what I would like to, to see is a little bit to incorporate sort of broader structural solutions that perhaps uh, people in, you know, people like me, and uh, well, Neff isn't quite there yet with the normative, uh, so I'm sure in the next couple of years he'll <laughs> publish another book with normative solutions. But that's what we we'll look at, right? And here's just a couple of things. For example, you talk about the fact that central banks cannot control investment decisions by asset managers, right? And I absolutely agree with you. Central banks cannot control decisions by BlackRock and other uh, asset managers, you know, what, how to invest. But is that a given that is sort of some kind of natural law? Can central banks actually have new tools, new mechanisms of shaping those investment decisions by changing the incentives? And for example, you know, I'm thinking here about uh, using the trading desk that the central banks have not for monetary policy purposes, but for purposes of maybe tamping, tamping down certain bubbles in certain markets that are uh, uh, you know, growing. Can central bank use CBDC, the digital currency, as a new tool of monetary policy that would actually diminish the need to rely on repo markets, for example, right? In other words, that's not how we think about central bank digital currency these days, but think about it in that sense, right? And suddenly a whole new set of solutions opens up. Uh, what would be other public actors' role in, in this space? For example, you've written about development banks, national development banks in Europe, uh, but you know, I've written about the National Investment Authority proposal, right? Can we create new asset classes that would actually allocate capital in a different way and maybe change the incentives of capital markets? And of course, when I'm talking about these things, naturally, selfishly, I'm channeling my own work and my own proposals, right? And of course, you're not bound to follow, to agree or disagree. What I would like you and encourage you to engage with is the concept going beyond what the SEC talks about when it talks about runs on funds and whatnot, but think about more structural solutions. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Now we're trying to push the owl a little further. Close enough. Yeah. I'll just, <laughs> the, owl, the owl needs to move a little bit in terms of. Owl is like the chest. The central bank is moving farther and farther away from the. Thank you.
I'll just do online. Thank you. <laughs> okay, Dr. Yeah, thank you. I, I knew it would be bad news to follow follow Sawa. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, you know, uh, I think she covered a lot of um, what I want to say. Um, I, I think I'm going to put the emphasis in slightly different places. Um, but I, um, I, I strongly agree with how, how she framed these issues. Um, uh, so, you know, one of the things uh, uh, Matthias said uh, was use the phrase clash of cultures um, uh, with reference to uh, the uh, regulatory battles uh, over the last decade and a half between market regulators and, and central bankers. And um, uh, I want to help us think about that clash of cultures by highlighting another clash of cultures, which is, I think, sort of uh, the clash of culture Sally was talking about um, uh, between bankers and shadow bankers. Because bankers, and this is going to, uh, my remarks are going to be very US focused, but in the, in the US, uh, bankers are a very different group of people um, than shadow bankers. Um, so the, one of the key moves um, that, uh, that Matthias makes um, is to frame the post-crisis regulation of money funds, repo markets, and open-end bond funds around financial market liquidity. So money fund regulation, repo market regulation, open-end bond fund regulation on his account are about the governance of financial market liquidity, which I think is a really nice phrase. Um, uh, rather than about financial stability per se. Um, in many ways, I think this is the viewpoint of the central bankers and the market regulators um, who built today's system and, and their sort of successors who, who saved the system from collapse in 2008. And I want to focus on a very similar question to Sally. I want to focus on why, why U.S. policymakers care about financial market liquidity. Uh, why is liquidity their goal? Um, why is the problem with runs on money funds, repo markets, and open-end bond funds that they impair liquidity? Um, uh, what would happen if we um, eliminated these runs by simply eliminating these types of runnable funding? Um, and to answer this question, to understand why, why these regulators think money funds and repo markets and open-end bond funds, these inherently unstable uh, funding structures are valuable in the first place, I think it's necessary to sort of go up a level and first consider the US system for money and banking in the way that Sally did and how it evolved. And so I'm gonna sort of cover some of the same ground, but I'll try to emphasize different parts. Um, and I'll take a, maybe a bit more of a legal um, uh, angle. So financial market liquidity was not always an important goal or even a goal at all of central bankers, uh, definitely not in the Fed. So for most of American history, capital markets in the United States, they, they were not primary sites of credit allocation. The, the pivot point of the dollar-based financial system in, in the heyday of the 20th century was, was the banking system, was bank loans. Um, and the reason why banks dominated credit allocation is that they issued most of the money supply by design. So they, they had the franchise. Um, and the... Uh, you know, the government issues in the U.S. and in, in most countries, paper money and physical money directly, pu direct public provisioning, but the U.S. banking system is an outsourcing scheme. Um, and so it's a particular type of public-private partnership. It's an outsourcing partnership. Um, and the sovereign public uh, through the central bank and the FDIC uh, is is backstopping bank deposits and, 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 and bank deposits, deposit check money, ledger money, that's what fuels the vast majority of transactions uh, in the economy. Um, and it, you know, is the primary source of transaction reserves. And so banks issue this money through, through lending. They create more deposits when they make new loans. So their lending is money financed. Um, and because their lending is money financed, they're the, they, they were the most important credit allocators. Nobody else could do this. Uh, in fact, the New Deal Congress prohibited anybody else from doing this. And that law is still on the books. Um, it empowers banks to create deposit money. It bars other firms from competing with them. It subjected banks to public control um, through a central bank, through, through, through the Fed. 
Um, and it set up a whole structure for how the banking system would work. In the US, very, very diffuse system. Um, so capital markets existed, but outside the banking system, explicitly outside the banking system, legally outside the banking system, banks um, were barred from, from being in the securities business, outside of government securities business directly. So liquidity in capital markets, we had capital markets, um, depended on bank lending. Uh, bank lending to dealer firms. Um, and, and dealer firms could, could borrow from banks, they could borrow in the capital markets themselves, but they couldn't mon money finance their balance sheets. And so their support of secondary uh, markets for securities wasn't money financed. And so one way of thinking about the project to promote capital market liquidity is as a project to shift the center of power in the financial system from banks uh, to non-banks, to, to securities dealers and shadow banks. And these, these firms wouldn't be subject to public control the way banks were. Um, it turns out they're run by financiers in New York. They're not run by local elites spread out throughout the country. Um, these firms would turn out to be um, uh, much bigger, much more concentrated. Um, and this, this reform project was, was, was very successful. And the way that it happened um, was that the central bank uh, facilitated it. In the 50s and the 60s and the 70s and the 80s, um, they helped non-banks copy the bank business model. They helped them money finance their lending. First, they did this by backstopping their repo liabilities, by going around the statutory scheme to offer the equivalent of a discount window to, to dealer firms. They did something similar for your dollar markets. Um, and, and so we get to a point where we have all these deposit alternatives, all these other forms of money now being issued outside of the banking system with the implicit backstop of the Fed. Um, and um, what, what this is doing is creating deeper and more liquid capital markets. Um, securities dealers don't need to rely on banks for funding. And so the credit that is allocated to the capital market system can now be priced better than bank loans. Um, and uh, you see a shift uh, as a result. And the policymakers who, who brought this about, they thought this was a good thing, right? Uh, they thought this would be more efficient. Um, they thought greater private ordering was good. They didn't like the New Deal system. Um, they called that financial repression. Um, and, and there's a different group of people, this is sort of cultural point, uh, who are running the shadow banking system. They were on Wall Street, they went to Harvard Business School. Uh, they're very, very different from the people that ran the traditional banking system in the US. Um, and, and the policymakers who were doing this, they, you know, they thought that there were some technical benefits to capital market lending as opposed to bank lending. I think it's a good thing that securities can be held by a broader range of investors, that they can trade on the secondary markets. Um, but they had other goals too. They, 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 they thought that um, um, uh, having, having, uh, having shadow banks be at the center of the credit allocation system um, would facilitate bigger business combinations because the banking system was so diffuse in the US. It would facilitate globalization because it would operate uh, across national boundaries. The problem, obviously, and I think Matthias is really good about this in his presentation is it's really, it's really un, uh, unstable um, and it relies on this backstopping and there's no ex ante public control. That's of course by design when they're developing it. But um, by 2007, you get to a point where, um, you know, there's more deposit alternatives than, than deposits. Um, uh, and uh, there's just, uh, and, and there's huge risk that is built up and um, because there's no ex ante control. And so the whole thing uh, falls apart very rapidly. Um, and the central banks are taken by surprise. They didn't, they, they thought that money could manage itself basically. Um, and uh, I think Batista is exactly right when he says 2020 was the second, 2008. And um, it revealed that none of the reforms that were put in place after 2008 um, went to the root of the problem. Uh, the runs were more severe than in 2008. They required more central bank support. Um, and, uh, and now we're at this weird place where um, the central bankers uh, want to extend, to some extent, uh, bank regulation to, to the shadow banking system that was of course originally supported because it wasn't regulated. <laughs> um, 
And, you know, the Fed today announced that it would shrink its balance sheet um, and it wants to tighten financial conditions. Uh, and I think there's an open question about whether it's going to be able to do this without triggering instability in the shadow banking system. Um, because from a certain perspective, the massive shadow bank balance, the massive Federal Reserve balance sheet and, and, and all the Federal Reserve's interventions, including quantitative easing, are really about stabilizing this shadow banking system. Um, and we're really at a crossroads where it's not clear that policymakers have much of an idea about how to sustainably govern financial market liquidity um, in a system where uh, shadow banks um, are money financed um, and banks uh, are not at the center uh, of, of the system. So, um, I, you know, so I, you know, I, I don't have specific suggestions for for uh, uh, for the next version of the paper. But what I would what I would what I would love to see is, um, especially sort of in the first part, sort of this additional sort of context um, about the stakes. Um, of the overall structure of the system. Uh, because I, th I think it helps illuminate uh, the, the clash of cultures amongst the regulators. Uh, the, the, the regulatory agencies were created as part of the New Deal system. And so of course the, cap the, the, the market regulators were designed to regulate something that wasn't money financed. And now we have this weird system, we have this weird uh, situation where they are suddenly in charge of the, they are the monetary authority. The SEC would be better positioned as the monetary authority than the central bank in terms of the tools that it has. And this is just totally um, perverse. And so the backstory I think illuminates what's going on with the clash and why it's so problematic. Great, thank you. We need to all that yes. a little bit. Um, so um, we have a few minutes left um, for questions and answers. I did see that there were two in the chat, but I also want to encourage people from the floor. And then maybe um, also the, the, the panelists. I myself have some questions, but I will just wait until hearing what others have to say. So let me just see what any questions from the floor. If not, then Mat um, uh, Matthias, do you want to... Do you want me to read or can you read? I can questions? read, yeah. Can you, can you read the so, question from the... Uh, and then for the first one, I'll have maybe some other... And then some comments, and yeah. yeah. So, uh, so the first question by David Schwa is, uh, perhaps it is unfair to ask, but what about the recent proposals for some kind of liquidity backstops for commodity markets because of the uh, LME meltdown? Um, I do not know about this backstop. Uh, does anybody else? Yes. They will do. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> so in the wake of the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine, uh, there has been uh, a lot of volatility in uh, commodity markets that has really uh, jeopardized the solvency potentially of some of the dealers in commodity markets. And uh, there have been proposals both from the industry and I think from uh, Various central bank maximalists in the in the uh, policy Twitter sphere uh, for the Fed to set up a facility to support uh, support uh, trading in these markets. Uh, and I, I, the way I look at this is is the sort of consequence of a post two thousand and eight world where the central bank has taken on this much larger role of acting outside of the regulated banking system. So the Fed pre-2008 was just an administrator of the banking system and it had a set of tools for that. And then it started using its balance sheet to deal with the shadow banking system. And now they're just increasing demands on how the Fed uses its balance sheet. And whenever something is going wrong, there's a thought that the Fed should use balance sheet. Um, and so it's, it's, you know, it's, there's, there was no particular, uh, it, it was outside of the imagination of any of the legislators that had crafted the Federal Reserve Act that, that, that the central bank would um, ensure that there was liquidity for commodities dealers, that, that, that that's what it was for, that, that that's an off the wall idea. Um, but we sort of opened the door to that type of, of, of central bank doing fiscal policy. Um, and and uh, 
so now 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 we're in that world where people uh, people want it. People want the central bank to help that. That's everything. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I would just only quickly add to that that it's also a result of the sort of the financialization mm -hmm. um, of of the economy, right? It's sort of this is what happens in the world of finance. You you allow certain things to grow for the sake of liquidity, like for example, you know, commodities derivatives. We we should have them because that creates secondary market trading and increased liquidity and blah blah blah. And then before you know it, the dynamics of the financial markets affect commodities. The dynamics of commo physical commodity markets now become a financial system problem. And whenever we have a financial system problem, we only have one balance sheet. That's the Fed. So I, I just want to maybe can I add to this uh, a little bit. I mean, in, in effectively, the only truly liquid asset is fake issued money. Right? That's the only truly liquid asset if you use your definition, right? It's the only one that you can sell without a haircut ever, right? And so anything that we create that is denominated in that currency and makes the promise of being convertible into that currency will you know, be relatively less liquid, but will make the push of for, for liquidity support eventually. And so and if, if you look at it from this, and I think this goes to the cognitive bias question that you all and sort of in the, I just, I just can't even imagine how a regulator of the capital markets doesn't see that the assets that have been traded on a capital market or commodity market are ultimately convertible in cash, into cash, and therefore are, of course, linked to the monetary system. And I think that the, 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 the cognitive device that we have made between capital markets and, and money markets between the monetary system and the financial system is something that is utterly fascinating to me, but it's 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 nonsensical at the same time. But I think that's the world we live in. Let me just make this additional point: FSOC doesn't work, right? Cannot work. We thought we just had a coordination problem in 2008, and that's where we created FSOC and similar mechanisms in the EU to coordinate financial market regulators, so one hand would know what the other is doing. But in fact, it's actually a, a culture clash and a massive cognitive. Um, uh, problem that, that I think most of them have in terms of understanding how the financial system truly works, which is trouble. Because then, I mean, the regulatory structures that we have put in place cannot work. And I think we also understand it's not only complete capture by the financial industry, which I assume knows much better what's going on than the regulators, but it's also this, I think, this, this intellectual life or this theoretical world that we live in that makes uh, no sense. But you can trace it, of course, into finance theory and economic theories, mm -hmm. but it's um, it's uh, disturbing given the problems that we have in So sorry, I had to jump in here as well. <laughs> um, interesting discussion. Do we? Do you want to respond briefly to? I, the I would, I would, like, I would like to, to and then we take the, the yeah. last one. Yeah. So um, these are great, uh, great comments and great suggestions. Um, first of the soul, uh, I I agree with this, and I think actually it's uh, uh, Diman Minsky has made very similar, very similar very important points about um, the question of um, access to the central bank's balance sheet. And I think he has suggested that when the Fed gets again more active in the capital markets or in the money markets, it has more control. So that was Human Minsky's answer, not my answer. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I agree with you both on the need for more causal clarity at the beginning of the paper which I was looking for <laughs> and um, I'm still looking for and I, I, I have some and then also some normative aspects. So there is an aspect in terms of first, maybe where sociological analysis could provide some insights. It, it seems to me when I'm comparing the FSOC to the ESRB, so to the European Systemic Risk Board and the way that they operate between the ECB and ESMA, the European Securities Market Authority, that I can observe a more collaborative style of, um, of interaction uh, in the case of Europe. And I think that has given rise also to more progressive, interestingly, more progressive proposals that I think then lead to the normative part, uh, which is, so what, what, what ESMA is currently proposing after this dash for cash thing is um, to use system-wide stress tests of liquidity in which you stress tests to simulate uh, sell-off behavior of the entire industry as a whole, which this is actually the intellectual shortcoming of what market regulators have done is you cannot ask uh, one agent to simulate 
the system. Mm -hmm. First of all, they don't have the data. Second of all, they don't have the incentive. So why would they simulate the financial system? What, what, what? But when ESMA does that and they have developed these tools, as has, I'm not sure if S, uh, SEC has, but ESMA has, they can actually foresee liquidity problems. And therefore, so basically my push would be in a sense, and then we can argue whether this is meaningful or not. Huh? So I agree, this is the cutting edge. This, we don't know how this unfolds, but the public authority in theory could say, I see a future liquidity problem because all of you guys are investing in these assets. And my simulation says that it, this is really not liquid. So I nudge you or I, <laughs> I dare you or whatever, not to invest more than so and so much into this asset. This is like, and then the question becomes if these systemic observations can arise because of the new cognitive tools that they have developed, how do you put this into practice? And so uh, one option is you, you play with the liquidity buckets as the regulator. One option is, uh, and, and then it gets interesting. So the way that the Brits have dealt with this 150 years ago, when we had already, according to Merlin, something like we have today, they have basically changed the discount rates. So they have said, we, the Bank of England, do not discount this trade bill because we don't like these guys. They do too bad, too shitty business and so on. But we will discount this trade, this business because that's okay, that's sound. And so they have had, had much more active role within the market to manage the liquidity by giving these signals. So that might be a way of, of reinstating a control for the central bank by making uh, possibly, uh, I mean, one option to me seems to be to aggressively assume the market maker last resort role and to say, I will set the discount rate because I think some things are good and other things are bad. But if we do that, then we, somebody has to say, this is good credit, this is bad credit, this should happen, this should not happen. And uh, in a liberal government that we're currently in, this is something that, many people have a big problem with, right? Yeah, Andrew Jackson is rolling over in his grave, <laughs> you know, when you propose a central bank that just decides what's, what's good credit, I agree. what's bad credit, right? It's, it's a concentration of power, um, you know, in technocratic hands to some extent, instead of uh, necessarily private hands of private investors, but it's still an extreme concentration that makes a lot of people nervous. Okay, let's go to the final question okay. in the chat. Okay. And, uh, uh, yeah, so by the way, Eric Monet's book on the Credit Council uh, might uh, be very interesting. And we, we have a forthcoming special issue on accounting, economics, and law. On that. But uh, do you think it might make sense to consolidate capital market and banking regulation and supervision into one single financial regulatory agency is what Ignacio Orellana asks, as some countries have done in recent years. What do you think would be implications of such a consolidation be for shadow banking regulation? So I must admit, Ignacio, that my answer to my two <laughs> discussions here was very much inspired by your question, <laughs> because I was trying to suggest that that, that might actually be um, a good idea. But in essence, a big question becomes, would a financial stability committee one that brings together capital markets and central banks be the right place for this? Or would it be only the central bank? I don't know. I mean, I, I, I think, yeah, maybe Sally should say something about this, but it has been impossible in this country to reorganize the financial regulators, right? I mean, after the, even after the 2008 crisis, it was on the agenda again, some consolidation, because the idea was it's, it, it's a coordination problem. I think after reading your paper and hearing your comments, I think actually that might not even have been the biggest problem. The problem might have been the cultural problem, and then it doesn't matter whether you put them all into one room, they fight, or they fight from different angles you know, of, the, um, of, of, of washing from the different um, um, uh, places. So I think we really need, I think, to work beyond just coordination um, and, and think about what the conceptualization of our financial and monetary system if we want to make any monetary system. Mm -hmm. Any other? Yeah, Josh, can you come closer to our owl? <laughs> I just want to follow up on the last thing you have said about like, and I kind of sort of think it, if you see that you can collect anything that you said, like the SEC, like you're talking about the SEC might have better tools than the Fed. And I want to think about sort of what are those tools? Because it's somewhat like going to what he has just said about, so if the Fed is the, you know, the market maker of last resort and they're sort of bounded you know, backstop everything, blend against everything. They're not allowed to make those choices. I think that's what you're getting at. Like, it, 
but like what would the SEC, those, the tools the SEC has that would be good for the Fed to have? Because just to make sure I understand, the backstopping thing is at the end of the day, they're loaning against assets, right? And the definition of the problem is more of liquidity. They claim that it's a problem of liquidity and not a problem of shitty lending. It's the technical term. <laughs> it's to say that like it's just over, you know. Yeah, the Fed should. I mean, the Fed should do it because they've got the, they've got the time for us, right? It's just a matter of time. So, like, what would the tools be if they could get along? Like, what is the SEC tool? Which is, you know, again, they, what the SEC can't do is say like. Yeah, we'll, we'll just discount, you know, we'll, we'll buy that, but at a discount, right? Yes, you can't do that. Then in theory, you can do that. Or a bank can do that. So sort of like, what is this sort of like the thing that might ship back and forth across those? I'd be interested to hear that. Yeah, so this is a huge and really important question. And I could talk for 10 minutes trying to answer it. Uh, let, me, let me say three things. First, um, what's my normative view about what we should do. I think an institutional architectural rebooting is the first best solution and the only solution that I would have confidence uh, uh, would be durable. And the overarching principle should be that we regulate uh, the issuance of money claims, the augmentation of the government issued money supply uh, functionally, uh, according to a set of rules, um, uh, you know, wherever it is. And so the, the regulatory perimeter for banking is coextensive with the activity of banking, understood functionally, which is how we do all the rest of financial regulation. So if you issue a security, uh, if you call it something else and, you know, some type of contract and you try to pretend that it's not actually a, a, a debt or equity security, the SEC goes after you in court and insists that you follow securities laws. This happened with initial coin offerings, this happened with all number of functionally different things. This is how insurance regulation works. It's how mortgage regulation works. This is just how financial regulation works, except when it comes to money and banking, where we've allowed for a very formalistic approach and the proliferation of unregulated bank money. And so you need a, you need a monetary authority that regulates. If you're going to have a system of, of money that involves private money creation, uh, that regulates the franchisees, that manages the franchise, and nobody else can get in it unless they have a franchise. That just has that. That's the only durable system. Um, uh, so that's that. That's the idea. Um, and I said two more things. So let's say we don't have the idea. We're in the second best world. Um, one one approach to the second best world is to have the um, existing regulators that happen to find themselves as the primary regulator of the entities that are actually engaged in a banking business to try to use the tools they have to effectuate some type of regulation like the sort that would be appropriate for banks. So uh, that what the SEC can do is it can impose bank-like regulation on money market funds, and it can also um, regulate the repo market uh, uh, in ways that uh, are bank-like uh, in terms of haircuts, um, and I haven't studied the Securities and Exchange Act and the various laws that we have on the books, but I think there's a variety of, of options that are right now sort of off the wall, it's so not part of the conversation that the SEC could take to um, deal with broker dealers um, and all these other parts of the capital markets that are involved money financing and try to basically shrink, shrink them. Um, especially the most uh, runnable. The, the, the other option is to have the central bank do it um, using non-regulatory tools because it doesn't have the explicit formal regulatory authority. That's the whole problem. It, it regulates banks in an ex-ante way. Um, but since it ex post backstops all this stuff and the only reason this stuff is able to uh, grow so large is because there's a perception that it ex post backstop, what the Fed can do is just announce in advance, we're only gonna backstop stuff that looks like this. It can basically create its own regulatory regime and say, here's our new standing facility for repo. Here's our new program for Euro dollars. 
And here are our rules. If you want to have access to swap lines, anybody issuing dollar denominated deposit like instruments in your jurisdiction has to follow this set of rules that is going to be congruent with the rules that we have for our banking system. And any dealer or hedge fund or firm that wants to do issue, be in repo and get access to our repo facility when things go wrong, here are the rules they need to follow. And I actually think that if the Fed were to do something like that, um, it could have a significant impact because I think the market understands that if you're not going to have access to the, the Fed's accommodation during bad times, that it's not going to be money good. And um, uh, it, it is a fragile way to try to solve the problem, but it, it, it's, it's better than nothing. Just to make sure I understand the SEC problem is, what the Fed can do is it has two things, which is it can I mean, it also can back stuff if it really is a liquidity crisis. We do want the Fed to load. We do want them to in the current system. We do want them to kick out, you know, cash. Um, like that's a good thing. And, uh, which is, but the SEC, the SEC can't do. But they get yes. out for it. But they also buy shit. Yes. And that's the problem. Like, yes. That's the you know. The, 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 the SEC has the ex ante tools, and the central bank has the ex post tools. Yeah. Just, just to make sure that our folks on, online understand us. So the follow-up question was basically that in crisis, we of course want to have the liquidity boost. Um, yes, uh, otherwise the system crashes. But on the other hand, I'm announcing that maybe some parts of the system will be allowed to crash, at least creates a level of uncertainty that might constrain the expansion of the system. So I just want to give Saul and then Matthias uh, just a couple of minutes to respond and then I think we have to close um, uh, this gathering. But uh, well, I, I, I don't need to respond, but just to sort of follow up on what Lev said. Um, I think there is another issue here that has to do with this sort of the ability of um, banks and non-bank firms, particularly securities and derivatives dealers, to affiliate uh, under a single corporate structure because the SEC regulates broker dealers. That's true, right? And it has a lot of uh, powers with respect to, you know, forcing broker dealers, for example, to um, you know, provide liquidity or whatever and not issue, over issue money claims and whatnot. The problem is that within that financial conglomerate, the broker dealers frequently have these arrangements where a lot of that, a lot of that risk from money, money like liabilities actually uh, ends up on the balance sheets of the banks themselves. So to the outsider, it looks like things are normal. You know, things that should risk that should belong to banks belong to the banks. And then the broker dealers are just white and fluffy, you know, nothing to see here. And this is where the problem is. So in that sense, uh, I, I just, um, it, it, just to echo uh, Katarina's point about how we need to kind of rethink the fundamental premises of, uh, you know, what the SEC is for and what the Fed is for. I think this is the challenge. Yeah, if I if I can can follow up on this, I think um, because in the end I, I agree that aggressively assuming the market maker of last resort and putting up the conditions is the thing that I am waiting for and it's the thing that I actually don't understand why the central banks are currently accepting to be in a position where they have to act and have to bail out and have to step in. But, but basically the paper is about the incapacity to impose conditions. They, they just, they're there, something bad happens, they have to bail it out, but they cannot engage and bring about, and I don't, so this is what I'm trying to understand. Second, I think that because you mentioned earlier that this would, what I said would be an awful lot of power in technocratic hands. I agree. But if I say as the Fed, ex ante, I'm only going to backstop these kind of papers with this kind of criteria, there's also um, a normative underlying question here. The question is what are the norms that allow you to delineate or to demarcate what you consider good lending from bad lending. And the way that the, the Brits have done it 150 years ago is that they have just looked at the issuance rate of these trade bill guys and they've said, this guy is issuing too much. There's too much risk in his business. So I am going to stop discounting this guy. 
And this was strong enough as a tool to keep this trade bill system that they had, which was short-term money market. There was no capital market we use, more short-term money market. But they could control it because this, the Bank of England was in the market. But that meant, in a sense, and this is, I think, also what Minsky says when he says, let's reopen the open discount window, let's use it. But is that we have to trust the practical knowledge of the guys in the market that, that can say, this guy is issuing too much, too fast. This is, or, or we have to codify it and normatively have a huge discussion on it or both. But um, we need, I think there is no way of going around the need for the central bank to assume its role and try to direct the activity that it has to backstop anyway. So I think right now we're in denial and denial is the biggest problem that I, I see. And I think that's actually where I see a lot of these different people are converging in the sense of like the world that we live in and the, the models that we have to make sense of that world and it's, they don't match <laughs> and how we make sense of that now is I think that's a, a great closing <laughs> world a word here. Uh, so thank you so much, Matthias, for coming. Thank, thank you, Saula and Blair, for the wonderful comments. Thank you for coming. Thanks for people online um, for joining us. Um, and um, and uh, yeah, have a wonderful evening, everyone. And um, see you soon.